Broadcasting from Baltimore, Maryland, and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here is your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. Today, we are going to talk with Mitchell Krauss. We actually pre-recorded the interview uh, a while ago. You can hear that in the discussion when we talk about the VIX being elevated uh, and the market being limit down. But I still thought that today is a good day to listen to this because Mitchell has a lot of smart things to say. I'm sure you've never heard of him before, and I want you to know him, and I want you to hear what he has to say. But first, as usual, I have a few thoughts to share. You may not know, we don't say it often enough, our, our mission here is to help our listeners become better investors. You know, we do that a number of different ways. We try to talk with a lot of really smart folks who have good investing ideas. And, uh, you know, every now and then I might have an idea for you. And I think the, the probably the best way we've helped people become better investors lately is we've talked about the coronavirus every single episode since our January 30th episode. Uh, and we gave you a pretty decent bond trade to do. So where are we with that? The stock market dropped 34% like faster than it's ever done before. The global economy is looking at a massive contraction. U.S. economy is, is suffering. Over 10 million people out of work at this point. And the market has has bounced really hard off of the March 23rd bottom. It's up about 20% or so here. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's about 20%. So what do you do? Well, I have a couple of ideas about this. One is just the, the obvious. The obvious is that this is classic bear market behavior. It really is. You, you get the big down moves, obviously, and then and also the big bounces up in bear markets. That's a this is classic bear market action. So it's just happening on a faster than usual time scale. And I think that kind of screws people up a little bit because they say, well, it happened so fast, it's probably just, you know, a big dip, right? It's it, instead of a 10 or a 5 or 10 or 20 percent dip, this one is a 34 percent dip. And since we hit 34% down, of course, there's been quite a bit of buying. There's been a lot of big up days. I mean, like a 5 or 6% up day is not a big deal. And that's classic bear market behavior. Some people are saying that the, the bear is over. It was quick and it's over and we're back in a bull market now. I'm not the guy to tell you that one way or the other. There are other people who study the history of price action so closely, and they have very rigid definitions of how you know you're in a bull market, how you know you're in a bear market. I just go with the general down 20% or more, we're in a bear market. So that's that's sort of where I am. And there was, I've seen some interesting thoughts about this. Like, for example, just, just a little tidbit from Jim Bianco, Bianco Research, that I saw on Twitter on Tuesday. And Tuesday was an interesting day. Bianco said, the Dow Jones Industrials average was up over 4% and closed down on the day. He says, since 1925, 95 years, up more than 4% and closing down on the day has happened once. One other time, October 14, 2008, then Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson forced the banks to take TARP money. And then he tweeted a second tweet on Tuesday. He said the S&P 500 was up 3.5% at the high and closed down on the day as well. Then he says since April 1982, which is when the high low, uh, he, he's implying here with a little note that that's when the high low close data for the S&P 500 began. He says since April 1982, that has happened three other times. <laughs> and guess when they were? <laughs> October 3rd, October 14th, and October 17th, 2008. All three of them. October 2008. And he concludes, I don't know if this is true, but he concludes, the market continues to trade like October 2008. 
And from then it was six months and another 25% down before the ultimate low, he says. You know, it's seductive to take a big, complicated, hairy thing and turn it in, you know, just boil it all down to one statistic. I don't think you can really do that, but it does reinforce what I've said, doesn't it? I mean, it's classic bear market behavior. And the, my first thought upon reading that was, see, what was I doing in October 2008? Oh, right. I was pounding the table to buy automatic data processing because everybody said it's going to be a huge recession and everybody's going to be out of work. And the stock just went straight down. And you can see, I mean, the chart is like down, 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 and then boom, straight down. And I said, this is a fantastic business. It's, you know, it's a cash gusher, high returns on equity, great balance sheet, like little or no debt at that time. And, you know, it, it's going to emerge probably, you know, sh the way the way this usually goes is all the biggest, best financed, most financially secure companies emerge stronger from a crisis than they went into it because their competition, some of their competition disappears and a lot of it weakens. So I was pounding the table to buy that thing and it became, I don't know if it still is, it was the number one performing recommendation in all of Stansberry, open recommendation, open for some time. I think um, Doc Eifrig's Microsoft recommendation might have eclipsed it, maybe. But that Microsoft recommendation was actually, I think it was Tom Dyson's when he w took over. And then, you know, then I took over and I kept it up. And then Doc Eifrig took over, he kept it up. So he gets the credit for it now. But point is, the initial move, like like everybody knew we were in hell and and stocks had fallen quite a bit. And the only thing to do was look around for great businesses to buy. That's what I was doing when, when we were about here, you know, according to Bianco, in the 2008 crisis. I was looking around for great businesses to buy. And, you know, I was, I had, by then I was already three or four years into my world dominator kick, you know, buying the, the world dominators, the biggest businesses in a given market, you know, things. And I defined it kind of loosely because I know, you know, you, you can't, be too rigid about that sort of thing. So like I called Berkshire Hathaway a world dominator. I, I think I said it was one of the biggest reinsurance companies in the world, but that wasn't really what it was about. It was just a big, great business with a fantastic balance sheet and a management that does, knows how to handle the cycles. And I recommended all kinds of stuff back then, Walmart and Microsoft and ADP and a whole list of them, Johnson & Johnson, Procter & Gamble, and they all did real well. All recommended, you know, pretty much around the time of the crisis. Prestige Brands Holdings was a small cap company that actually dominated niche product markets in little healthcare over-the-counter products, wart remover and all kinds of stuff like that. It did fantastically well. So my point is, look, I was bearish for three years, right? But the time for that has passed. Like it wasn't, it's not about me calling the bottom. It's about the top being behind us for me. It took me three years to be right. So I'm not going to try to get cute here. I said this before. I'll probably repeat it more. It, it's a it's a mistake for me personally to try to get cute and call the bottom and say, oh, nope, this is a bear market rally. Can't buy anything. And I think that's probably true, but I don't know. This could be a bear market rally. 20% with blazing speed right off that March 23rd bottom. Could be. Probably. I mean, it would make sense historically. I don't know. I just know that the top is behind us and I was wringing my hands and worried when everybody else was super duper happy, clappy, watching the market go up, telling me I was wrong. Now I'm looking to see what the great businesses are that are trading at decent prices with everybody wringing their hands and bearish. I did an interview with Jessica Stone recently that's going to be on the Stansbury website at some point here. And she said, you know, there's a lot of bearish people around here. And I don't know if she meant around Stansbury or where, but, you know, I was bearish when nobody was bearish. And now I'm, I don't know if I'm bullish, but the time to worry about the overall stock market has passed for me. So I'm just looking around to see what there is to buy. And as far as what you should do right now, I'm not saying buy, 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 buy. I sort of am, but let me qualify this. Most people shouldn't be doing anything all along. Most people should just let their 401k ride. It takes a hit. It'll come back. You know, they won't even need it for another 10 years, let's say. 
I mean, if you need it in 10 months, you, you shouldn't have had too much money in stocks anyway. But if you need it in 10 years, hey, you know, cool beans, you're fine. But, you know, you, you're in a tail event. A tail event means like something highly unlikely has happened and the market has been hit really fast and really hard. Oh, what should I do now? People think they should do something. Well, most people should not do anything. They should just leave their 401k alone. And, you know, maybe maybe I think, you know, gold is a good thing for the next few years because, because there's going to be a lot of money printing or something. And, you know, that didn't, that worked out okay last time around. Gold was a good buy during the crisis and it peaked several hundred dollars higher than it was trading or maybe even over a thousand dollars higher than it was in the crisis, in the 2008 crisis. So, you know, that sort of worked out, but then it crashed, of course, right? And it crashed back down to a thousand dollars from 1900. So I'm not telling you that Gold is going to be the greatest thing in the world, although that it would make a lot of sense to me. It makes sense to me to, to own some gold here, to own the physical and even gold stocks too, and just kind of hang on to them. I think they'll do well over several years here. Uh, but I think great businesses will do well too. You know, a really great business that's got a huge competitive advantage, gushing cash, great balance sheet, consistent margins over a long period of time, good returns on equity and you know, they maybe raise their dividend every year or do something, or they're maybe they're good at share repurchases. Almost no company is, but maybe they are. Something like that. Those are the five financial clues that we use to identify great businesses in the Extreme Value newsletter, right? Cash flow, balance sheet, margins, dividends, share repurchases, and return on equity. So, so that's my great business spiel. If you can hold if you can buy a great business right now and hold it when it's tw down 20 or 30%, you should, in my opinion. Anything else is really going to be difficult. I know some guys who are really excited about tanker stocks. And I saw an article in Oil and Gas Journal recently about this frontline, the CEOs of Frontline and Euronav and one other one that I can't remember. CEO of Euronav says, if things keep up the way they are, he's going to make more money than his market cap this year. <laughs> and that's Hugo de Stoop from Euronav. That's interesting if it's true. Uh, because, see, the tanker rates, the charter rates are going up because there's a glut of oil and people want tankers for floating storage. So the tanker rates have gone up. So, you know, the stocks are, have, they sold off along with everything else. I know some people are buying natural gas stocks hand over fist because they've been absolutely obliterated. But man, that's a risky trade. You're going to wake up one day and you're going to be down 40, 50 percent along the way here. And, you know, they're up 10 percent a day the past week or so. But, you know, that kind of action, you're going to you're going to you're going to have to have intestinal fortitude to hold that kind of thing. So, yeah, you, you can do things like that if you know yourself well enough to be able to do it. But if you can't, you can't, and you just do nothing. I mean, when, when things are this bad, you know, when the market is down and there's 10 million people out of work, I understand the, the sense of fear. My sense now is that maybe this thing passes more quickly than I thought it might. I honestly don't know, but I know that stuff is cheap enough. The world's not going to go out of business. And, you know, I'm starting to recommend stocks in extreme value and getting very excited about some of them. So summing all this up, then, we're in a tail event. Don't try to trade unless you're a scarred, experienced trader. It's If you want to do anything at all, stick with the really great businesses. And you know what they are, right? Google is a great business. Amazon is a great business. I'm not saying these are the ones I'm buying right now or recommending in extreme value, but just learn to recognize a great business. Don't buy the stuff I just said. Don't buy Google and Amazon. Learn to recognize why it's a great business. And then, you know, it's only the ability to recognize that enables you to hold, right? You can't just take someone's advice blindly. You can't like read a newsletter and say, well, Dan says buy this, so I'm going to buy this. Oh my God, it's down 30%. Dan, you're an idiot. No, that's not how it works. 
I got a really thoughtful, thoughtful email from, actually, I got two of them this week from people who thanked me, not for making a good pick. The one guy said, you know, your picks haven't been that great this past year, but you were spot on about worrying about the market being too high, et cetera. And he was just really thoughtful. He went on for quite a while. I wish I could read the email, but it's so long and I didn't know which parts to pick. But he has another one that was shorter that I'll read later on. But the point is, I felt like I had a reader there who recognized that you had to do your own work to get enough conviction to act and to to maintain discipline and stay the course, right? He, he I think he said he got out of stocks early on, you know, maybe earlier this year, so he missed all this horrible drawdown that everybody's enduring. And he did it because he said he read some of my stuff and he said he logically deduced that was the only thing to do, even though that's not what I said to do, right? So you have to be very thoughtful. You have to have the skill to recognize a really great businesses. There are businesses I've been holding in extreme value for 10 years. Well, one that I've been holding for 10 years and people say the thing's gone sideways for a lot of this time. What are you doing? It's a lousy investment. Maybe so, but it's a fantastic business, and I have absolute rock-bottom conviction on a bunch of things. The assets are going to generate, some of them for centuries, they're going to generate cash. The management is going to handle itself extremely well throughout the cycle. They're going to behave well. That's the key. That's, That's the real linchpin. They're going to manage the balance sheet, so they're not going to be getting in big trouble, you know, financially. So I have this conviction, and I know it's a great business. Like, if you told me it was a lousy business, I would fillet you. I would fillet you and have you for lunch. If you told me it wasn't a good investment because the share price hasn't done great, then we could have a more balanced conversation. I'd have to say, well, you're right. It hasn't done great, the share price. But it's a fantastic business, and I want to learn to recognize and hold fantastic businesses. And many of them will perform extremely well. And this is like one of the themes you'll find throughout not just Extreme Value, but Stansberry Research. Porter Stansberry just started a whole new product called Forever Portfolio. In his other newsletters, they've, they've emphasized knowing what a great business it is and hanging on to it for a while. So if you have that knowledge and that experience of, of knowing what a great business is, that is how you get the conviction to hold it when it's down 20 or 30 percent. And then... Go with God and and buy great businesses right here, right now. You know, with the caveat that we're up 20% off a big, big, hairy, you know, minus 34% bottom. So there's probably a correction around here somewhere. And if we find an ultimate bottom 20% lower than the March 23rd bottom, guess what? Wouldn't surprise me a bit, but I'm going to keep hunting for great businesses. Bear markets are the time to do that. Okay. I, th- I think I've beat that sufficiently to death, haven't I? <laughs> okay, let's move on now. We'll talk with a really thoughtful guy named Mitchell Krause, and I'm really happy to introduce him to the world. Let's do that now. Today's guest is Mitchell Kraus. Mitchell Krause began his journey in the financial industry with boutique investment firm Ryan Beck & Company, focusing on bank stocks and mutual bonds. After eight years with Ryan Beck's private client group, having spent quite a bit of time in stock information and conversion centers, he transitioned to a hybrid institutional sales sales trading position within the firm's bank services group. And moving on to 2012, he willfully stepped away from his institutional team at Stiefel, folding back into Stiefel's private client group, moving his family from the New York City suburbs of New Jersey to Raleigh, North Carolina. We'll talk about that in an effort to pursue his initial want upon entering the business. We'll talk about that too. In 2016, he began creating and running discretionary portfolios using capital preservation strategies focused on protecting downside risk. After nearly 22 years with the same firm, name change through acquisition, but same firm, 22 years, then Mitchell quit in February of 2018 and founded Other Side Asset Management, a firm focused on providing investors with true informed consent when it comes to investing. You've done a lot of stuff, Mitchell. Welcome to the program, sir. Thanks, Dan. I'm I'm giving your your guest list. I'm, I'm humbled to be here. Thank you very much. 
Yeah. So I, I like your bio that you sent us, and I'm intrigued right away by your initial want you, you put in your bio. In an effort to pursue your initial want upon entering the business, you moved from the New York City suburbs of New Jersey to Raleigh, North Carolina, stepped away from Stiefel's private client group. What, what was that about? You have me curious. So, so my, my initial want when I got into this business many, many years ago, or what I, what I thought I was going to do, was um, educate investors or help educate investors. Um, I, I originally wanted to be a teacher, and coming from two teachers, uh, both of them said, you're not becoming a teacher. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I have this... Um, I, I like helping people. I I I, I want to teach people, and upon entering the business, you know, I thought that that was a a, a great thing to do. Let's teach people how to invest, and um, you know, over the years, you you, you learn that uh, this business is a little bit different. And and while you think you're teaching, um, you're really basically selling. And uh, it took me quite a while to to understand how the business actually worked. It took me, uh, the business is very siloed. So retail stays on retail, private wealth, you know, whatever you want to call it. Retail is retail. Institutional is institutional. Typically institutional is institutional sales, institutional sales, trading, trading. Um, and the hybrid group that, that I eventually went to work with, um, we, we kept everything pretty much in house in our own little group. So we did sales, we did sales trading. So being exposed to, to a handful of different things within the industry, um, kind of gave me a little bit of a perspective that was, uh, uh, that's different than the average bear, I would say. So in, in wanting to teach, um, I've taken my 20 some odd years of experience throughout the industry. And now I am doing my absolute best to teach people the, the, the ironic thing about that is in, in wanting to teach people and helping teach people, I, I think I've become a perpetual student. And um, <laughs> it, 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 there's not a day that goes by that I don't learn something from somebody smarter than me. Those sound like pretty good days. <laughs> you know, what, it, it, what Porter Stansberry says, he says, uh, you know, there's no teaching, there's only learning. And as you've shown us that's uh that's kind of true you want to teach and then you just wind up learning uh, which is great and and it, wanting to educate investors is really great too so i'm, I'm not a terribly original guy uh, <laughs> I, I i was i was trying to figure out a name for my company and and i was talking to a buddy of mine and you know and he said well what do you do and i just i said well i want to tell him the other side of the investing story because there is a side that the vast majority of people never hear um, you know, and, and that, that became the origin of other side asset management. Um, and, and it's kind of like, you know, a salmon swimming upstream because I'm, I'm often telling a story that most people find very, very difficult to believe. Um, you know, and when people have heard something for so long that they, they, they have a mantra, they have a narrative in their head for so long that when they hear something that's really quite different from what they're used to hearing, um, you know, is that guy crazy or does he really know what he's talking about? Um, and uh, I, at this point in time, I've stopped worrying about what others think. Uh, I will, I, I never really cared about what others think, but I guess I, it's more important to me to reach the people that I can reach. <clears throat> And educate them. And if others, uh, if others don't want to, you know, play along or follow along, as as Porter often says, uh, as I've read him for for years, horse meat water, right? <laughs> yeah. So, what is it you're telling people that you think they might not want to hear? You mentioned. Well, that. well, I think the vast majority of people are are built on a belief. Um, or, or most investing portfolios are built on a belief that uh, risk mitigation comes through diversification via a set of different ETFs or mutual funds. Um, it's the industry mantra. It's it's been the industry mantra for you know decades. We could argue about its origin. I would 
I would suggest it dates back all the way to, to 1975, um, you know, May Day, when discount brokerage firms were actually able to come about. And, uh, you know, and, and most people don't realize, but for the vast majority of history, uh, commissions were fixed uh, on Wall Street. And you couldn't offer discount commissions and you couldn't offer discount products or index products. Um, and then uh, Vanguard was formed on that day and Schwab started introducing uh, in, uh, uh, discounted commissions and incentives changed for people. So, you know, where the incentive used to be trading behind a computer screen, trading stocks back and forth uh, back in the day, uh, when incentives changed to becoming asset gatherers, uh, people started hiring professional money managers. And, um, you know, I, I think, I think that the, the whole incentive structure just, just changed. Um, it, it's one of those things where you've, you've cited it before. I've cited it numerous times, Dalbar, right? Dalbar studies, QIAB studies. Um, you know, I, I, I think I can quote from memory, you know, um, diversification fails investors when needed the most because in times of crisis, everything goes down together, right? Yep. Yeah. So, so I think the last 14 days has proven that to people. So what I try to do is educate people that there are different, uh, risk strategies, uh, that you can utilize to protect your downside in, in an environment like this. Um, and so far so good. You know, we're, we're still down a little bit and, and I'm kicking myself for, for being down, um, as I, I think I could make some better decisions. Uh, but we are doing, um, leaps and bounds better than the, every indice that's out there right now. Uh, so, so I just try to give people the option to understand that there are other ways to invest while protecting your capital. And the more capital you protect, the, 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 uh, you don't have to work as hard to make up money, um, when markets do come back. That sounds good to me. So, you know, I know you don't want to give away secret sauce and I appreciate that, but like, can you give me an idea, you know, how you fulfill that last bit that you said about, you know, ways to protect things? Are we talking about? What, what are we talking about exactly? Well, well there's, no, there's no particular secret sauce. I, I, I mean, I, I'll sit down with anybody and have lunch with them. And if they want to utilize my services, that's great. If they want to take what I have to say um, and do it themselves, that's fine too. Uh, again, I, I, I do want to try to help people and I, I do want to teach people. But, um, you know, uh, capital preservation strategies, something as simple as uh, trailing stops, Right. Um, as, as you've preached for quite some time, uh, to, to hold different assets, to hold some gold, to hold some cash. Um, I, I've been telling people for years that they should have physical gold, which is something that, you know, I don't get paid for. Right. You know, it, it's not about bringing in all assets under management and managing everything to get paid as much as humanly possible. It's about giving people the proper, uh, the proper guidance so they can be as diversified and protected as possible. If, if you have, you know, X, million of X millions of dollars, right? Well, the average individual will most likely say, well, you can own REITs here. Well, I'll buy REITs for you, right? What about just going out and buying a, a, a rental property? You know, that's physical, that's tangible. What about having physical gold? What about, you know, uh, what about having a different asset class that's not correlated to those markets? It, most people are trained to do their best to stick with an index. And, and I think that that's, I think that that gets people in trouble in, in many cases. Um, in case in point, uh, last year I, I, I had a pretty good year. I, I was up about 18 and a half percent, 18.7 percent roughly. Um, you know, people were upset because the markets were up more. Um, you know, if you, if, if you're, I did it with X percent in cash. I think I had 20 some odd percent in cash. I had X percent in gold. You know, it, I did it from a risk management perspective where people were not taking on absurd amounts of risk. And I had plenty of people say to me, well, why aren't we there? Right. Why aren't we getting 23 or why aren't we getting 28 
30%? Why aren't we getting 23% like the different indices? And I would point to today, <laughs> or I would point to, you know, the last, I would point to the last two to three weeks uh, as to why we weren't there and why we didn't want to be there. Um, you know, the leverage in the system has never been greater. The credit quality in the system has never been worse. Um, you know, I, I do my best to take a, to take a, a macro approach, a, a, a broad macro approach. And for years I've written about the debt and leverage in the system. For years I've talked about the, uh, you know, the auto industry and the manufacturing industry and industrials, you know, slowing and slowing. It, it, and I, I take an approach and I try to educate people from the standpoint of taking what, what Wall Street says and then breaking it down into something simple that people can understand. So, so uh, Mitchell, I, I'm going to interrupt you here. Shoot, go ahead. I, I just, I can't resist telling the listener, if this guy made 18% last year and he was, what, 20-some percent in cash plus holding physical gold, risk-adjusted, that freaking rocks. I mean, you rocked it. I, I, I realize your clients would complain because they see the market up or whatever, and people listening might go, eh, 18%, eh. But certainly by now, it's what's happened in the first you know, couple months of the year here, they can appreciate 18%. But man, I just want to tell you, to, to, when I hear you 18% with 20% with cash and physical gold holdings and stuff, I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. I, I, I want to clarify. I didn't hold physical gold. I told people to hold physical gold. I had gold within the portfolio because I know people aren't going out and buying physical gold, right? <laughs> so I can have as many conversations with my clients as possible. I know very few of them are actually going to go out and, and buy physical gold. But I did have the gold, you know, gold hedges within the portfolio. I had the cash. I had some gold uh, some gold miner stocks, et cetera. Um, but yeah, the, the gold that I held within the portfolios were not, was not physical, but it was gold. Okay. Whatever, man, if you got 20% or so in cash and you're doing 18%, I, I just think that's really cool. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, I, everybody wants to compare to something else. Everybody wants to compare to an index. I mean, if you compare to, you know, everybody was crushing Warren Buffett at the end of the year, right? Uh, you know, the articles, the articles were, you know, why does Warren Buffett have 130 billion in cash? Why was I holding as much cash as I was holding? You know, Warren Buffett arguably one, arguably one of the greatest investors of all time. Does he have his flaws? Absolutely. Can we learn from his flaws? Sure. Right. You, you know, uh, we can pick and pick apart every move that the man makes. He lives in a, you know, he lives in a, a bubble and everybody scrutinizes him. You know, but the reality is you don't need to write that article in 2020 if you follow what Warren Buffett does in 2018. And I know you highlighted it because I heard you on the show highlight it and I highlighted, highlighted it in my, uh, my quarterlies. I want to say Q1 of 2019. I believe that the quote from his annual report from 2018 where prices were sky high. And, and if prices were sky high in 2018, enough as to where he and he and uh, Mr. Munger were were not going to make a, a big purchase to hold for you know a lifetime. Well, when asset prices got even more sky high, <laughs> you, you've got your answer right there. And now I would bet that most people appreciate the fact that Warren Buffett has 130 billion or whatever the number is in cash because when things go on sale. And, and I don't know if they're, I'm not convinced that they're, they're not done selling off, but when things go on sale, you want to have cash to buy something. And in the traditional model, the traditional buy and hold wall street model, how do you buy more if you're just, if you don't have any cash to, to buy? Yeah, exactly. I mean, go ahead. Well, I, I was I, I was just wanted to you know ram that point home because you you know it, if you're a kind of long term value oriented investor, you have that Buffett moment. You say prices are sky high, uh, presumably you have an income, so you're building cash some kind of way. And to me, that building of cash 
It's just a natural outcome of refusing to pay sky high prices and recognizing some of the things you've talked about, you know, the leverage in the system and just, you know, the risky nature of extremely inflated asset prices, you know, plus leverage and other other problems that are coming out now, then you you should naturally find yourself with plenty of cash right. when the market is, you know, limit down 7% to <laughs> exactly two right. days in a week or something. So you you guys have preached, you know, uh, trailing stops for, for years. So and and I also am of the belief that you don't want to panic in scenarios like this, but I believe that you you do want to follow your disciplines, right? So, you know, going into limit down, I'm fifty percent cash, twenty percent exposed to treasuries through, you know, TLT, ZROS through the curve, and I have five percent short exposure to the Russell. You know, so it, it it's one of those things where I think. Everybody wants to be up when the market's up, right? I think that there are times for people to understand that it's okay to not do what the market's doing on a specific day, right? So I know that today with certain holdings as they are, I might be down slightly where the market so far has held, right? But if, if you're, if, we're down as we are, and nothing's broken yet. There hasn't been a long-term capital scenario. There, there, nothing's re- you know, we could argue that th- there's something structurally wrong within the system when the Fed has to bring out, you know, 1.5 trillion in you know Fed repo on a three-day period of time. And you know, by the numbers that are going on right now, nobody's really using it. Um, you know, you, I, it's above my pay grade, but. You know, the reason why nobody's using it, it, you know, the the talk is basically, you know, restrictions based upon Dodd-Frank and Basel III. You know, you've got nothing's broken to the point where over the weekend, you know, somebody's getting bailed out. And when you have a a, a volatility over 71 I think it was over 70 today, or the VIX was over 70. I mean, when you have that type of volatility in the markets, and and that type of volatility is even you know coming to gold, where gold is teetering on the 30 level, um, you know, that's extreme volatility. That's volatility that that we haven't seen in in ages, and we're we're living in a marketplace where it, it's unprecedented. We. You know, I I wrote on Twitter the other day. I mean, we we can liken this to 1929, to 87, to 01, to 08, but the reality is, it's 2020, and no no bear market or no crash or no uh, you know a recession or a recessionary period has to be the same. There's no rule that says everything has to be the same or it has to be exactly like, you know, but. But there are different characteristics that kind of label where we are. And when we, we haven't seen a swath of credit downgrades yet from Moody's and S&P, who have said that they've got, you know, the energy sector, you know, they're, they're doing a sweeping review of the energy sector. You know, what happens when those triple Bs, triple B rated bonds, uh, which are investment grade, are downgraded into junk? You have a market where the triple B credit has has exploded to three and a half, four trillion of six and a half trillion investment grade, and you have a junk market that's one point two trillion dollars. If you have five companies downgraded that are triple B that add up to five hundred billion, how do you put five hundred billion of of supply? onto a market that can't handle it. We haven't had that moment yet, but there's nothing that says in, a, in an environment like this that it can't happen. You know, uh, we, got off, we got off topic a little bit, or I got off topic, I apologize, I'm a little verbose. But when, when you have the Fed come out with a one and a half trillion bazooka and the, the market rallies, you know, down 2,200 talking Dow points, I get it, 
when market rallies to only being down a thousand and then closes limit down, and you know that they've come out with another trillion for the next three to four weeks or whatever it is, five and a half trillion of repo that they're that they've lined up, and and the market still closes down on the lows of the day, uh, something something tells me that I might want to have a little bit more cash than be aggressive in a, a bounce that we but, currently have right now. Yeah, you know, you make a good point about the credit situation because things were things were weird on, I guess we'll call it Black Thursday, the 12th. Things were weird on Black Thursday because we saw m some money flowing out of like investment grade bonds and even like the longer dated treasuries briefly. And, and then those things kind of came back. But I, you know, I, I was all hepped up on this bond trade because I thought, well, okay, nobody sees how bad this virus thing is going to damage the global economy. The Fed's reaction function, as Ralph Powell puts it, is, is to cut and, and bonds will get a nice lift up. But at this point, I'm like, you know, sub 1% on a 10 year is the most unattractive thing in the world, you know, and the fact that the Fed might continue cutting just it doesn't doesn't really do a lot for me. I mean, th their big emergency cut was like nobody cared. And and now we're starting to see the flow out of like the IG, the investment grade stuff, you know, starting on Black Thursday. Sure. So you might be you might get your credit event. <laughs> I think you're going to get it. <laughs> so I, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know factually if a credit event will come. I would think that it, I, I would think that it will based upon the amount of leverage that's in the system and, and, and what's going on. You know, I, I, I would say, I, I would say one thing to, to, you know, the outflows from, from IG, right? So the trade, the, the, the short term trade, it, it's starting not to work. It, we're talking about liquidity crunch right now. We're kind of talking about there's not enough liquidity in the system um, for for whatever the reason. You know whether it's the banks don't have the ability to to they don't have the collateral to to put back to the Fed. Whether whether it's just dollar shortage liquidity that Raúl has spoken about. You know so at this point in time, you, people are selling what they can. People are selling what they're kind of up on, and that's the trade that's worked. But because the trade backs up in the short term over the past four or five days, in my opinion, doesn't mean that the thesis is gone. If the Fed does cut rates to zero next week, what, which is which is anticipated or whenever this is airing, I don't know if they, they, they've done it or, or haven't done it. But if the Fed does cut rates to zero, and I understand a 1% isn't necessarily attractive, but it's not just about the 1% not being attractive. It's about, am I going to get my money back? It, 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 would I rather have 0%? You know, I've wrestled with this too, Dan, <laughs> you know, but would I rather have 1% or 0% than down 40? Well, right. That's the trade. That's what happened in Europe, right? They took interest rates negative and people still bought the stuff. Some people had to because they were running institutions and they had capital requirements and they could only buy certain securities and all that. But there was a genuine fear trade where they're like, okay, you know, lose me a half a percent over the next five years. I don't care. You have that going on here right now. I mean, you, you, the, the Fed just brought out five and a half trillion over five weeks. I mean, that's unprecedented. And when you leverage the system, you know, when you leverage the system like that, nobody knows what's going to happen. I, I would love to sit here and tell you that I know what's going to happen, you know, but we, we can't be that absolute. When you live in a world of absolutes, you usually find yourself wrong on one side or the other. So, you know, you, you have to hedge yourself. Um, and, and yet, you know, I still think that that trade that Raul spoke about, um, you know, is, is on. I still think that the 10 year treasury could go to zero. Um, I, I think 30 years come down, but just because it hasn't worked out over the last four or five days, I, I think that, you know, in, in a market like this where people are looking for liquidity, people are finding liquidity in what they can and finding liquidity in, in what has been up. And there comes a point in time 
where eventually they have to sell the crap. Eventually, whether it's a cascade that I've talked about for a couple years, I, I've never used the word cascade, but I've talked about you know uh, ratings-based mandates. So in 2018, very early on, I wrote a piece talking about uh, passive ETFs and and my greatest fear being bond ETFs, because there comes a point in time where investment grade mandates kick in. And, and I, I know that you've had a, a conversation um, with the Dean of High Yield, um, you know, and I know he said that in a point of time where, you know, investment grade bonds are downgraded into junk, um, people won't necessarily sell right away. They won't sell at fire sell prices. And, and, and I, I respect that, uh, you know, there, there's nothing that says that I know more than he does, but I did make calls to, yeah, that's exactly right. So Marty Fritzen, brilliant guy. I mean, you know, and I know Marty has talked to Porter and, and there are times where, you know, he asked when high yield spreads did blow out and well, it happened during a crisis. During a crisis, usually everything is, you know, all bets are kind of off, but where I'm going with this is, you know, uh, oh, well, I lost my train of thought. Um, you know, at, at a point in time, 2018, early on in January, I, I called a handful of people that I, I had once spoken to when I was on the institutional side. I called some CFOs of some banks that I used to talk to. I called some attorneys that I used to talk to. Uh, I called some, um, you know, some money managers, asset managers, and, and, and talked about what would happen if they had an investment grade bond that did you know, go, uh, that did, uh, fall into junk. And many of them said that they wouldn't wait to see, you know, what the price of the bond was, that they would just sell it, which is counter to what Marty said, right? You know, and the reason they said that they would just sell it is because their thought process was if it does get downgraded and he holds on to it, what if it does go bad? What if it doesn't just come back? What if it goes bad because it's not just, you know, off price wise because of forced selling? What if the credit goes bad and then the regulator comes back to him and says, why didn't you sell this bond? You have an investment grade mandate. It went to junk and you didn't sell it. And many of them said, I don't want to be caught holding the bag. So if, if you have five credits, you know, whether it be Oh, I don't know, uh, AT&T, General Motors, you know, Ford, um, uh, uh, Capital One, w whether or not you have a handful of these companies that are super leveraged with a ton of debt downgraded into triple B, there comes a point in time where people are going to need to sell those. And, you know, I've talked about ETFs freezing and people look at me like I'm crazy, but you're giving instantaneous liquidity to a product that has collateral, underlying collateral that can freeze. And the reality is, if that does freeze, then people are going to roll over and sell their equities to cover their margin calls or whatever it is they have to cover. Um, you know, and it, and it becomes, you know, a company doesn't even have to go bankrupt in order to trigger that chain of events. It, it, it's, it's structural. And, and I think that, um, my opinion is I, I don't think enough people look at the structural makeup of our markets, of the ETF world, um, you know, of the incentive system or what we're incentivized to do as brokers. People don't look at the overall structure and how it will affect things moving forward. It takes time for things to play out. Yeah, that's right. We had um, Adam Schwartz from Black Bear Fund on here quite a while ago. And he put out a letter recently, like within the past couple of days here of within a couple of days of Black Thursday. And he was saying, you know, our credit shorts are finally doing their thing because he was he's been on to this, you know, how they make the sausage in the in the bond ETFs mm -hmm. for some time. And, you know, same concern, exactly what you're talking about. But I'll tell you, he was he was, you know, he was hurting, I think, you know, he was a year or so ahead of it. But you know, when the stuff arrives, it it takes the okay. takes the stairs up and it jumps out the window or takes the escalator elevator down, whatever you want to say. I think it jumps out the window. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I titled it, you know, I titled the piece recently, you know, escalator up, elevator down. 
and uh, you know, most people just, it is tough to, to make the turn. And there are some brilliant people out there, uh, again, much more brilliant than I, you know, the guys at hedge eye, um, you know, if you don't follow them or, or you don't have a subscription to hedge eye or anybody out there listening, it is well worth the money to spend, to listen to those guys. They are some of the smartest guys, in my opinion, on wall street period. And they break everything down into math. Um, you know, and, and they, they're macro guys, but they're, they're, they're fractal math. Um, they are, they, they've called this and they are killing it. Um, you know, my, my disciplines kind of contradict some of the disciplines that, that I should have moved to. So, you know, following trailing stops, you know, selling it when it hits the trailing stop. I mean, I'm going to have to revisit, you know, some of my thinking, but still stick within a rules-based system. But I've worked on incorporating some of what they've done into what I do. And I'm still doing, well, while I'm not pleased, well, I, I am pleased with where I am. I will always be my harshest critic. I, I, we're, we're trouncing, you know, we're, we're really outperforming from the standpoint of, you know, markets being down anywhere from 23 to, you know, 34%, you know, whether you're talking S&P to Russell, you know, we're down, but we're not down nearly that much. Um, you know, so it's about preserving your capital. Um, it's about maintaining that and preserving your capital. So I don't have to work as hard on the, on the way up, but also, you know, kind of getting ahead of the game. Again, I'm still learning every day I'm learning, but I'm also trying to teach people that it's not about what you hear from the, from the main narrative that's spewed. It, it just, it, it, there are other ways to do it. There's another side of the story and you don't have to be a victim in a down market like this. Yeah. So the main narrative being that whole, you know, you can buy a bunch of mutual funds and you're diversified and you don't need to think about it anymore type of thing. That's pretty what much. you're talking about, right? Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Genuine diversification is tough. I, I think people <clears throat> don't, I think you're right. It's, it's this simple topic. It's kind of almost a boring topic, but it's it's one of those things it's like boring 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 oh holy crap it's not boring anymore <laughs> you know and then then though you know gold has not been what people expected so far people don't realize that you know when when you're getting margin calls and things people are liquidating their gold holdings too and i think you have to look ahead that's that's my mantra right now i think you have to look ahead with gold because if you don't you're going to liquidate and and you're going to be caught off guard when it starts doing its thing, which it eventually always does, right? Because when they, they do these 1.5 trillion repo things, you know, bailing out giant hedge funds and the only people who benefit from that stuff, it's the beginning of weakening the currency, right? I mean, that's, that's their only out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, it's, Again, it goes back to that that treasury trade and and short term versus the the long term and what's going to happen. You know, I clearly I don't I don't know definitively what's going to happen. But if you are printing money and buying coupons and expanding your balance sheet, and which we clearly know that they're doing, I, I can't imagine how that doesn't have a, a positive effect on gold, which is typically the storage of value. Um, you know, and I don't understand how, or, or I, I'm, I'll have trouble grasping how rates don't go to zero or, or even negative, you know, um, uh, uh, about eight months ago, seven, eight, well, time goes by, uh, seven, eight months ago, I wrote a piece talking about the United States most likely going, you know, zero to negative interest rates solely based upon how much business we will lose. In, in terms of capital raises or debt raises, if companies like Ford can go over to, you know, the UK and borrow in euros at 1.1, 1 .1, you know, 1.51%, 1 I think it was back, you know, however long ago, seven, eight months ago, you know, if they're borrowing at such cheap rates and uh, didn't Berkshire just borrow at zero for five years? So, you know, if, if they're able to borrow at these rates and, and, companies are able to do this globally, then in order for us to, to, to keep that business here, in order for people to, to, you know, raise this debt in dollars, then they're, they're going to want to be competitive. 
um, from from a rate standpoint side, especially with balance sheets and and margins being compressed as as they are. So, you know, it, it's funny. I, I I cited the Dalbar studies. Uh, or I talked about the Dalbar studies, and that's what I used to do. But even in following uh, the guys at HedgeEye, you come to the conclusion or realization that, you know, when everything goes down, not everything goes down the same. You know, so these guys are are so good, in my opinion. You know, they've not only been right with what is working. And let's let's rephrase. You know, if if in a, in a time where we're in a low a deflationary environment at a time where we're in a low to no growth and and we know that we've had that environment for the last 6 to 7 quarters whether wall street wants to admit it or not if you look in rate of change terms and if you look at um if you look at just q4 alone of 2019 you know i think the s&p earnings, S&P 500 earnings for the entire quarter, uh, fourth quarter of last year were 0.62%. That's all pre-virus. You know, things have been, things have been coming down for, things have been coming down flat to negative for, for quite some time. So this virus just has really kind of pulled things forward and, and and kind of accelerated things, but it, it hasn't changed where we were going with a, with a, you know, collision of, debt, credit quality, and, you know, recessionary times. It, it, it just maybe, in my opinion, has taken, you know, mild recession into maybe a deeper recession or, you know, quite possibly even the D word, right? So it, I, don't, I don't think any of us have any idea what's going to happen because we don't know what earnings are going to be for Q1. We don't know if, Q2 is going to be exponentially worse because if we are on a two-week lag from Italy, if, right, if we're on a two-week lag from Italy and we close more down, you know, does Q2 look worse than Q1, you know, and and how far does that put us? Uh, I don't think we know the answers, but I do think that there are better ways to to mitigate and manage risk. Right. And I just wanted to pipe up too and say, not only were S and P five earnings lackluster, but in retrospect, like the Russell two thousand topping out in September of twenty eighteen was kind of, it looks like it was telling us something now, doesn't it? <laughs> because that was a heck of a move down, and it never never came back to a new high. Absolutely, I, I, the 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 um, short Russell exposure we've had on for quite some time. Um, and yeah, I'll give credit to, um, you know, the hedge high guys, hedge eye guys. Um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a nice hedge that, that I've had, um, on for quite some time. And, you know, I, I picked that one up based upon, uh, their work. So, you know, I, again, I learn every day. Um, and it's, it's not just a function of following somebody blindly. I don't think you ever have, you, you can ever follow somebody blindly. I think you, you, you have to learn, you have to do the work, you have to put the work in yourself. And if somebody arguably knows a little bit more about something than you do, right? Um, you know, you, you see where it fits within the, the scope and parameters of our model that we're managing and does it fit? Yeah, it fits. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll roll with it and, and, uh, and go from there. But, um, yeah, there, there's some brilliant guys out there who have called this. There are some, some smart guys who still think that we're not necessarily out of the woods. Um, you know, I happen to agree with them. And, uh, you know, again, it, it falls back to risk management and, and not necessarily just believing that buy, hold, ETFs, ETF model, um, you know, and anecdotally, I know a lot of guys who are retail retail brokers uh, in the industry. It's kind of where I was born, right? Uh, I had a stint on the institutional side, but I see this come through my doors, you know, as frequently as I sit down with people. You know, most people show me their statements, and I can tell them what's in their account before they even give me their statements. And it's one of those things where. It, it it doesn't matter if it's coming from big firms like uh, Merrill Lynch. It doesn't matter if it's coming from an LPL. 
uh, Wells Fargo, the vast majority of accounts that I've seen over the last handful of years have all really been the same. Everybody owns the same stuff. And it's because these, because the industry is allowing financial guys to go out and sell a model. And everybody's model is based off the, you know, the efficient frontier or whatever it is, low cost ETFs. And when everybody owns the same stuff, it becomes dangerous. Well, we've sure seen that in a big way. I mean, <laughs> everybody owns the same stuff and they ditch the same stuff at the same moment in time. Uh, you, you make a good point there. And I'm, I'm glad that, I don't know, I'm just glad there are guys like you around that, that want to educate people so much, you know, and, and people can go to your other, other side asset management website and kind of see what you have to offer. Right. And, and there's a lot of good writing there. There's a lot of good quotes and a lot of good insight and wisdom too, I think that back up all the stuff you're telling me. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, the website is other side, am.com other side, asset management, other side, am.com. And I do have an archive, uh, a, a library, um, where we've put up a lot of our writings, some of the stuff from 15 and 16, I can't put up based upon, uh, being with a, a previous firm. So, um, you know, but, but there's a lot of writing over the last handful of years and, and while I'm never going to be always right, the vast majority has been fairly accurate. If, if I've, if I've failed in, in any way, it, well, I, I, it, it's one of those things where I wish I were positioned a little bit more towards what, what I thought was going to happen without necessarily worrying about losing clients based upon not being as close to an index as somebody wanted me to be. Yeah, we all do that, man. It, it's it's impossible. You, you know, you're dealing with live human beings, right? Well, yeah. As a as a startup, I'd say uh, much more in much more sensitive to that than not, right? If I was working with a hundred million under management, and you know, five guys came to me and said, "Hey, you know, this is what it is." I okay you do your thing, right? In the back of your head, you know, when, when you're just, when you're relatively new on your own and the, there's always something in the back of your head. And I wrestle with that. Um, and, and, uh, I, I just have to, uh, be more staunch in my disciplines and, and, uh, I'm a pretty disciplined guy. So I, I know that I'll write that shit. Yeah. Sounds like it. Listen, it's been really good talking with you. I think we're pretty much at the end of our time here. And I always ask folks like you who manage other people's money the same question at the end. If you had, well, actually, I take that back. I ask everybody, absolutely <laughs> everybody, the same question, no matter what they do. And, uh, you know, so if you could leave our listeners with just one thought right now in these trying times, what would it be? Oh. <sighs> You know, I listened to your show fairly religiously, and I know that this question was coming up, and I've thought about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then you're put on the spot, and you go, "Jeez." I think the thing that I would leave people with is understanding that we we often live within a belief system. Uh, whether it's if God forbid your child is sick, and you run into a hospital, and you see someone wearing a white coat. You, you know, you'll do, you'll hand your child to somebody wearing a white coat and they could be the janitor. You know, you, you, they, they're wearing a white coat. You think it's a doctor. You give it to, you, you give your child to them. You don't know where they went to school. You don't know what they, you know, how they graduated. You don't know their history. We live within a belief system and the belief system in the financial world is my guys got me. My friends got me. He drives a nice car. He must be successful. He has a big house. He must be successful and good at what he does. You know, driving a nice car and having a big house or whatever it is doesn't necessarily mean you're successful in this industry. It means that you've raised a lot of assets under management and make a lot of money. And I think that there's a big difference. And 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 just because you golf with somebody every weekend or just because you know somebody or or they're a friend, it doesn't necessarily mean they understand how to navigate or manage risk. And and I think if I could leave somebody or leave people with, with a thought, it's, it's, it's okay 
to think a little bit outside the box and be a little skeptical, especially when people have gone through 01 and they've gone through 08 and now they're going through 2020. It's one of those things where do we learn? And it's okay to learn. It's okay to, to, to understand that I might not, I might be thinking a little bit differently, but thinking a little bit differently is okay than what my, my, uh, traditional belief is. Does that make sense? That's a big thought, but yes, it does. So that's, I guess that's what I would leave people with. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll be talking to you again sometime in the future. Dan, I, I, I greatly appreciate it. I thank you for, for you allowing me to, to, to talk on, on, on this, uh, podcast and, uh, you know, maybe I'll see you at an, uh, Alliance conference. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there. Talk to you soon, buddy. Bye-bye. Okay, it's time for the mailbag. The mailbag is where you and I get to have an honest conversation about investing and life and whatever is on your mind. You write in to me at feedback at investorhour.com. I read every word of every listener email, and I will respond to as many as possible. I'm getting a lot of long ones lately, so you know I can't read the long ones. But, uh, you know, I got a few really good ones here today. First one's from Bruce C. Bruce says, Dan, I enjoy your podcast every week and like to listen to it while exercising to keep my brain occupied. Always intriguing. I must admit that when Bethany, that recent guest, Bethany McLean, I must admit that when Bethany said there was a fine line between visionary and fraudster, I was surprised that the first name out of your mouth was not Elon Musk. Steve Jobs and his altered reality was perhaps his way of pushing outside the box thinking. That pales in comparison to the financial funny business and misrepresentations that spew from the great visionary Elon. My recommendation is that you should spend some time in flyover country where common sense mostly prevails. It seems you have been too long on the West Coast. <laughs> I'm just trying to give you every benefit of the doubt. I hope you appreciate my sense of humor. Yours truly, Bruce. Okay, Brucey, I, I do appreciate your sense of humor very much, and I thank you for it. But you're right. Yeah, Elon's a great example of the fine line between visionary and fraudster. I mentioned Aubrey McClendon when I was talking with Bethany McLean because she wrote a, a little book about, you know, she called it Saudi America, and she wrote, and it was all about the fracking industry, and Aubrey is like the main character of that book. So, you know, just talking with Bethany, that, that's what was on my mind. But you're absolutely spot on. Elon Musk is the, I mean, he's like the poster child for the, for the fine line between visionary and fraudster. Thank you, Bruce. Excellent. Yes. Spot on. Next, we heard from Vaughn M. this week. And Vaughn M. said something that I really want everyone to think about because I'll, I'll just read it. He said, I first assumed inflation, inflation, inflation following all this money printing, but I'm going to bet that Dr. Hunt, Dr. Lacey Hunt is who he's referring to, thinks deflation, 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 because M2 won't grow because even with the bank reserve rate at zero and interest rates near zero, they're not going to lend. And even if they did another dollar of debt, it isn't productive anymore. And the direct lending and checks being sent in stimulus are just slowing the fall of prices but will not effectively cause inflation. I say this not to be depressing, but to try and understand a bull case for precious metals during deflation as well as inflation. I want to think they will go up either way, Vaughn M. I think they will go up either way, Vaughn, but it'll be really, I think it'll be volatile in the precious metals as the dollar becomes really strong. And you're right. A lot of people talked about this during the great financial crisis, 2008, 2009, and they got it wrong then too, didn't they? They got it wrong. They said inflation, 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 and they pushed gold up to 1900 bucks by, what was it, September 2011, I think. And then, of course, it crashed because there was really, there was no inflation. I mean, there's inflation in the stock market. It depends on where you look for it, right? But, you know, wages soaring is the, is the big one that people look for, and that didn't happen. But I, I wanted to put your comments out there, and maybe people will Google Lacey Hunt, and they'll learn about M2 money supply, and they'll catch up with what you're telling them there, Vaughn. 
Lacey Hunt's a smart guy. He's been, uh, I mean, he's like probably one of the greatest bond investors ever. I've seen him at, where have I seen him? At Grant's Interest Rate Observer Conferences. You know, when people used to fly to other cities, there was a time way in the in the past when you would go to a place called an airport and you get in this big metal tube with wings. I know it sounds insane, but we did it. And it has padded seats and they bring you a bag of peanuts and a drink and stuff. But we don't do that anymore, so I don't want to confuse you. All right. Next is from J.H. And J.H. says, Hello, Dan. It was so great hearing a female guest interviewed on your show. I have not listened to every Stansberry Investor Hour podcast, but I have listened to quite a few of them, and I have wondered why I've never heard a woman interviewed. I thoroughly enjoyed the interview with Bethany McLean. She is obviously a careful, fact-based researcher and a clear thinker who is very well informed about many aspects of the financial world and society in general, J.H., so, J.H., get out your phone and, uh, and get out your notepad on your phone and take a few notes here. Episode 111, we interviewed Annie Duke. She wrote a really good book called Thinking in Bets. Episode 94, we interviewed Nomi Prinz, also wrote a couple of good books, former banker. Diana Henriquez was interviewed in episode 90, and she wrote a really good book called Wizard of Lies, and it was made into not a bad film on HBO, and, and she was in it playing herself. She played the part of herself interviewing Bernie Madoff in prison. It's Wizard of Lies is kind of the definitive book about Bernie Madoff. And so there's this scene with Diana and Robert De Niro, who played Madoff in the film. <laughs> it was kind of cool. But yeah, yeah, we've interviewed some women on the show. Okay, the next one is from Dan F. Same as me, Dan F. And Dan F. says, congratulations on another show. You are such a pleasure to listen to because you are honest, informed, and genuine. When I say informed, I don't mean that I agree with everything you say. I mean you inform yourself to agree that allows you to simply weigh facts as they're presented to you and form an opinion based on that rather than some overarching ideological bent. You're informed enough to change your mind if the facts warrant. You're a breath of fresh air in a world of media that I find myself increasingly unable to watch or listen to on both sides of the political spectrum. So thank you for that. He's got some more stuff here. But I just want to say, Dan, thank you for that, because I, I feel the same way. When I'm watching like TV news, it's just all so polarized right and left, Republican, Democrat. You can't get away from it. And, and I'm trying to be what you're, what you're telling me here. I'm trying not to have an overarching ideological bent. So th thank you for that. I don't want to read all the rest of Dan's email, but he also said, Basically, he thinks he got COVID-19, trouble breathing, fever, felt run down. He's normally an energetic guy. He spent a week on the couch. And uh, he's, if that was it, he says, yeah, you don't want to get it. it, it it's terrible. And I had said that in a previous episode. Thank you, Dan. Next comes Terry H. from Australia, from Dan Unda. And he says, hi, Dan, I've been listening to the podcast since you took over and enjoy the show. I'd be curious to hear your take on Porter's Stansberry Digest article, July 20th, 2018, and again, late March 2020, on why he lost interest in deep value investing and the difference in your viewpoint on deep value investing. Keep up the good work. Terry H. Down under in Australia. Terry H., thank you for that. Um, first of all, Porter's ideas are his and mine are mine, and, and you know, he doesn't like, I don't take cues from him. If I did, I think he might fire me. And if I did have an, see an idea of his that I liked, I would just tell you about it. Yes, I would say, yes, Porter's right about that. As far as deep value investing, we have to really define our terms here. Deep value is, for me, it's buying cyclical businesses when they're absolutely dirt stinking cheap. At the start of today's show, I mentioned the tanker stocks. <laughs> I took a a foray into these and got killed maybe, what, already two years ago. And now they're cheaper than ever. Good luck. I'm staying away. But as far as that type of thing is concerned, I'll continue to do it because you can, if you understand the risk and can manage the risk, you can make a ton of money doing it. I have nothing against, against deep value at all. Oddly enough, extreme value is mostly not about deep value. It's mostly about buying really good businesses. But we do some cyclicals in there. So, you know, we try to keep the quality high. We don't do the really beat up, dirt cheap, god awful stuff. 
<laughs> I'd like to think we don't. Anyway, our last email this week is from Al M. I alluded to him in my opening uh, spiel today. He wrote me two really thoughtful emails. and One of them was too long to read. Thank you, Al. I just want you to know I really appreciate it. He's got a shorter version of the same idea here. And it's really complimentary of me, okay? So just know that I'm only human and I love reading emails that are complimentary of me. But I do have a point to make that I that I believe goes beyond, you know, mere ego stroking for Dan. Al says, Dan, I wrote another email and hope these two emails get to you. Yes, they did, Al. He continues, I already said in the prior email that I was very pleased with your guidance as this stock collapse, stock market collapse, he means, was getting ready to commence. But I wanted to re-emphasize that I think your general guidance, in other words, the basic concepts of too much stimulation and the fact that it wasn't working and the business cycle turning down and over optimism came through very strongly for me. I do not think any advisor could do a better job of showing that the stock market was about to collapse. So thank you for an incredibly prescient insight into the stock market, an incredible vision as to the complacency of stock market investors, an incredible performance, especially in this complex environment and with so many of your colleagues getting it exactly wrong. I think he just means in general, maybe not necessarily at Stansberry. Thanks again on an unbelievably superb job of guidance. Although your stock recommendations were not too strong in the last year, the fact is you completely saw what was happening. And I hope that you feel a great sense of satisfaction of making that call and preparing your subscribers for this rather clear now debacle we have been watching, Al M. Thank you very much, Al. I can't say thank you enough for a couple of things. One of them is just, you know, it's nice to get a compliment. The second is, I hope you're all uh, listening as Al shows you what a thoughtful reader of our research he is. He doesn't just blindly take the stock picks. He admits that the stock picks weren't great, in fact. And he sold out, right? He made his decision. He gets the credit for doing what he did, not me. I don't get the credit for that. I just get the credit for whatever I did, you know, talking about how stocks were risky and the market was in danger of a, uh, of a drawdown. I certainly did not say we were going to be in a bear market in two weeks, but I was bearish for three years. And I talked about COVID-19 coronavirus since the January 30th episode. So I'll take credit for what I did. But but Al gets the credit for what he did. And what he did was be a very thoughtful consumer of Stansberry research products and of, you know, of other people's insight in general. That's that's really the way to do this. So right back at you, Al. Right back at you. You did it. You did a great job. OK, that's it for this week. It's my privilege to come to you this week and every week. As you know, I'm really grateful for your presence out there. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the world, and I know you you probably have other things to think about. If you want to see a transcript of any episode we've ever done or listen to every single episode we've ever done, just go to investorhour.com. I continue to get emails about transcripts. We have a transcript for every single episode we've ever done. Sometimes it takes actually several days, it turns out, to get the most recent episode's transcript up, but it will be there. I guarantee it. May not be there as soon as you want it to, but it will be there. And all the other episodes have transcripts. Just click on the episode you want, scroll all the way down, and there it will be. What you really ought to do is go to iTunes, subscribe to Stansberry Investor Hour, and click like. If you click like, it will push us up in the rankings and lots more people just like you will tune in and write hopefully lots more thoughtful emails like all the ones that we got today and all the ones that we get every week. Okay, iTunes, subscribe to Stansberry Investor Hour, click like and, and go to investorhour.com. That's where every episode and every transcript is. Okay, thanks very much. I really look forward to talking to you next week. Until then... Bye-bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email at feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is provided for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. 
You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network.